I've gotten the great honor uh, now that we have played some games and we have talked about the history of LARPs um, to start us to think together about how to make LARPs. I think Eirik ended his uh, presentation very well when he said, with this quote from Moreno where he said that sometimes enabling grown-ups to play is allowing them to play God. And designing a LARP or writing a LARP, um, these are words that we can use interchangeably, they mean the same thing. Uh, designing a LARP is in many ways playing God because we are making words, worlds and we are, we are making societies. And you have to decide everything. So the most important thing I say is don't panic. <laughs> it will sound complicated and it will sound like, oh, I have to think about a million things. Uh, but we are here all week to talk about this specific thing. It is not, the, the purpose of this half hour is not that you understand everything 30 minutes from now. It's that we, I introduce some ideas and concepts of how we can start to think about making games. Uh, and before we can start uh, talking about how to make new games, I think it's useful to have some words about how do we talk about LARPs at all. And now I see that it's difficult to see, so I'm just going to tell you what it says on the screen. Talk to talk about any LARP, some really useful words and concepts to have are world, scenario, characters, and rules. Eric mentioned very many times the word wor world uh, in, um, in his presentation. The world of the LARP is the agreed fiction that we decide that the story takes place in. Um, now, just to take examples and explain these words in terms of a game that you have all played, which is Snaphane or Partisan. The world of Partisan uh, is a fictional version of Sweden, which is also a fascist state. Okay? The scenario of Snaphane is that a group of neighbors are forced to identify the traitor among them or a traitor among them. Uh, the characters in, uh, in this game, in Snaphane, are all the, all the characters that you played in the LARP. They are also uh, the NPCs, as it's called, the non-player character, Captain Wikström, uh, who was played by, by one of the organizers. And then there are also characters inside the world who are not played by anybody, but who, who exist inside the world. So, for instance, um, the child of the single parent, in the building, exists in the world, and is a real per person inside the fiction, but it didn't have a player. And in a LARP, perhaps you could have like a person who, who is sending letters, and the person, somebody in the fiction is writing the letters, but you don't have a player for that. You only have a mailman who brings the post. And then rules, and rules is a little bit, it's a big area, so I'm going to return to that, but you can think of rules as like everything that decides how we behave and interact in, in the game and around the game, okay? Um, just to do this a little bit more specific, when we talk about world, that also includes genre. So genre means what kind of a, uh, what, uh, in what tone is the story told. For instance, is it a comedy or a drama? And deciding a genre and controlling a genre of a LARP is not uncomplicated. I think when you started playing the game that you just played, uh, When Our Destiny Is Meet, we were all told that you would play a feel-good romantic game. I heard some of the ends of the games and it sounded like it wasn't all feel good and it wasn't all romantic anymore. So the genre had changed during the game and sometimes that's completely okay and sometimes that can create some problems. So you need to be aware of what genre you want to achieve and then you need to communicate it. I think you all, when you played Snaphane, you played it as a very serious drama about living in a society like that. But it's, it would also be possible to play Snaphane as a satire, as a sort of comedy about the crazy and awful and bizarre things that we are forced to do if we live in those kinds of societies. And then it could be, like the characters wouldn't be having fun, but the players could be like, <laughs> especially afterwards. Uh, so it would be completely acceptable to do it that way as well. Sometimes the content of the stories doesn't decide what the genre is. You have to make an active decision about that. Uh, and that includes, in, and everybody needs to agree about what it is. So, and, and especially if the genre changes during the game, then everybody needs to, to change it together. So if this comedy turns into a drama like it did just now, uh, then it's, a, it's part of the mutual agreement that you all create together about what this story is. When we talk about scenario, maybe you would now ask, oh wait, why do you say scenario if you mean what the story is about? Why don't you say theme? 
Well, theme is also really, theme would be the question, what is this story about? And I think scenario is more about what happens in this story. Uh, theme, the theme of Snaphane uh, could be discussed for many hours, but perhaps one way of saying it is that the theme of Snaphane is bravery and compassion in op op oppressive regimes. How are you brave in a dictatorship? Um, what about the story? I already mentioned briefly that it's difficult uh, to say if LARPs even have stories. I think that LARPs have all kinds of stories, but you can't really decide beforehand exactly what they're going to be. So the story of the LARP, uh, I mean, you can have some kind of narrative directions and, and it's about something and, and somebody is the traitor and, and or somebody will have to be pointed out as the traitor for the game to work. And that is a kind of very top level story. But if you think about story in terms of who was the traitor and what happened and what did everybody do in the game, you only know that after. So the scenario is sort of the, the room in which the stories take place, but only after the game can you say what the stories actually became. Um, I already mentioned that the, that the characters can include uh, and can be played by others than players, or they're, sometimes they're not all played at all. Uh, and the characters are the focus, uh, the character is the focus through which every player experiences the story. And we often say in LARP that every player should feel that their character is the main character, the hero of that story, or the interesting loser of that story. And then rules. For a LARP to even be a LARP, there are some rules that are always there, and they are so obvious that we usually don't say them out loud, so I'll just say this once. For instance, um, for a LARP to work, we all have to agree that what, like the fiction, we all, when we're inside the fiction, we all behave as though the story is real, right? We all, we all pretend that it, that we pretend the same dream together. Um, and another typical rule of LARP that is not often said out loud, but can be, uh, and that you may have heard uh, for, for Snaphane, is that when you are, while you are playing the game, when you stay in character. I mean, I think in Snaphane the rule is, at least implicitly, or maybe some of you were told, that as long as you're inside the room, you stay in character. If you need to leave the game, or if you need to want to break character, you also leave the room, right? And then there are some other rules for Snaphane that it's possible to use. And some runs of the, of the game used these rules, and some didn't use these rules. And you can talk later about whether it changed something. So one rule in Snaphane is that the things that are revealed about your character during the game are always true. And another rule about Snap in Snaphane is that there is a gun, and it cannot be fired, but everybody behaves as though it is really very scary. And the third rule is uh, uh, that the challenge of Snaphane must be resolved inside the time frame, which is that one hour, otherwise the game doesn't work. Okay, so the rules decide, the rules are how we together decide what happens in the story. They help us decide what the outcomes, but they also decide how we act and how we interact together inside the fiction and around the fiction. Okay, so this is like the basics how to think about the LARP. Now let's, imag let's imagine a completely new LARP. What if we start to design a LARP right now? So then you can use these tools to kind of start to think about what, what, what would be an interesting game for you to make. I just made two, pulled two examples out of my hat. If I decided to design a game right now, I would think it would be very interesting to have a United Nations international deep space mission, and it happens in 2035, and that's the world. And the scenario is that the space program runs out of money because of bureaucratic reasons, but the astronauts are still in space, and now you have to decide somehow like what to do. Do we let them die, or what happens, and how do the astronauts feel about this? This is the scenario. And the characters in my game would be cosmonauts and astronauts and taikonauts from all kinds of different countries, and United Nations engineers and politicians, of course, who have voters and so on. These would be the characters. And then maybe I have some vague idea about the rules, like it would be interesting if, if the ground could only con con uh, communicate with space, like maybe once an hour, or some kind of limitation is always interesting. But just to give another example, this can be something very different. Maybe I want to design a game about which, where the world is a magical forest, and all the scenario is that the pastel-colored ponies who live in this forest, they have to select the pony president, and all the ponies, the magical ponies are all the characters, and all the ponies have superpowers, and everyone is super nice to each other. That could also be a really good LARP. Uh, but when you start making the LARP, uh, you, at this point, like when you have this idea, now you have to start to design, design it together. So that's then the next step. How do, you, how do you start to think about making this LARP? Okay. 
So there's, the LARP is going to take place somewhere. This, it's going to have some kind of physical or virtual location where the LARP is. So you need to think about that. And there are going to be some players, of participants of some kind, otherwise it's not a LARP, even if it's just you or one other person. Um, and there's going to be some kind of interaction between the players and, and the organizers, perhaps, and the location. And that needs to be designed somehow. And a good question to ask at this point is, what is the purpose of your LARP? Because if the purpose of your LARP is to make like a really wonderful half-hour entertainment where all the ponies hug a lot, then maybe you don't need to design, like you don't need to, to spend three weeks writing the constitution of Ponyland. You can do that if you want to. But then, but I mean, if that's not the game you're making, that's not, that's a wasted effort. And there's a real problem when you're playing God, you're like, I have created this world, I have to decide everything. I have to write all the languages and all of the tribes in all of the neighboring countries. And I just want to say, you don't have to do that. Like, if, if the purpose of your game is that it's a linguistics game about fictional languages, then it's super important that you design those languages well. If it's not about languages at all, then it doesn't matter. Everybody can speak B Belarusian and, and then that's fine, and then you don't ever need to think about that again. Okay. <coughs> And at this point, it's also important to define your restrictions. So, because again, like if you're like, oh, I can design everything, you're going to go insane. So what, there are some things you cannot do. Just define what they are. How much money do you have? And how much money do you, does your participants have? How much time do you have? And how much time do your participants have? And what other considerations are there? For instance, if this game has to be able to be played in an office in an afternoon, then probably it's really impractical for you to also build a giant spaceship that has to fit, fit inside the office. Like the, and that would be one restriction. Another consideration would be safety. So in, um, in Palestine, don't make a game about terrorists. Okay, like, so just like to have some, some very sort of different examples. And actually in most of the world today, don't make, like be very careful if you make, if you make politically charged games and think about how you, how you make them because, because it's quite dangerous. So, so there are all kinds of other considerations that it's good to think about before you start working because other, otherwise you may do a lot of like extra work and then you realize, oh wait, I, I couldn't do this because all of my players are five years old and they can't read or whatever, <laughs> yeah. And I'd like now to introduce the concept of a designable surface. And that means anything that you, as the game LARP maker, the LARP writer, can control. Um, if you are a painter and you start making a painting, then that you have some designable surfaces would be, for instance, how big is the surface and what material are you going to paint on? What is your painting going to portray? Will you paint it in a realistic style? And, or will you paint it in an abstract style or something in between? Will you glue things onto the to the, to the picture, will you, what kinds of colors will you use? Will you sketch first and then paint? Or are you just gonna paint directly on a wet wall and make it a fresco? How thick is the color going to be? Uh, is there going to be a frame around it? And where is it going to be shown? And are you going to try to sell it? And that's about it. I think that's some, somewhere there you're gonna run out of, of ways. Maybe you can write something on the back of the painting, but then that's, that's it. But the painting is a pretty simple art object. The more complicated the object becomes, the more designable surfaces you have. If you make a sculpture, like normally like a sculpture would be maybe, you know, slightly larger than human size, but you can of course also make, make a sculpture, sculpture that is the size of a building if you're trying to communicate some, some very large idea like this uh, sculpture in this picture. Uh, and so then, then you have some more, then the material is also important and the weight becomes an issue and how do you transport that there and, and how, do, how does the human watching the, the sculpture feel and, and what is the architecture of, around this sculpture, those also become sort of important for the work. And the LARP of course is even much more complicated than putting a, a, a sculpture in a square, so you have much, much more designable surfaces. And that is what the mixing desk is for. It's a tool to help you think of some of these designable surfaces so that you don't panic and you don't go, ah, I have to decide a million things. So you can just start, well, I'm just going to decide these nine things first and then we'll see what else needs doing. Right? There are also some non-designable surfaces in LARP. These were pointed out to me by Eric, thank you very much. One is, and mainly it's this one, the player's mind. You can't control what the player's know and feel and think before they get in contact with your game. And you also can't control how much information fits into their brain. But I can tell you this immediately. Players 
have less space in their mind than you think. So you need to be very economical about what you need to tell them. Don't write the Ponyland Constitution because they don't have time to read it. And even if they read it, they won't remember it. And if they remember it, that's awful because then they probably forget what all their pony siblings are called because they don't have space for all the information. So you have to choose what's important and what's not. Uh, but basically, you can never control the player's mind, but you're just trying to engage the player's mind in a great experience. Uh, but don't try to go there because that's just a waste of time. Okay. Um, if, in case no, somebody doesn't know what a mixing desk is, it's this kind of a tool where you have different kinds of sliders that control usually light or sound, and then you can make a piece of music, for instance, sound different by changing, putting up the volume up on some of them and down on some of them. And the mixing desk of LARP looks very similar, except it controls different designable surfaces of your LARP. Um, and now I, I want you all to just like take a deep breath. I'm going to run through the sliders, uh, all of them, just to mention them super briefly. You're not meant to learn them now. You also have the, this picture in your folder. And you also have a really good introduction text to the different sliders in your participant folder. And if you don't, it's in the new pages that are out there and you can get them there after. So don't panic. I'm just going to put them out there so we get some idea in this context of like the kinds of things that we can start thinking of. And then there are going to be presentations on the different faders uh, later. A fader is one of these things. Yeah. So I mentioned that place is usually very important somehow in LARP because LARP, we LARP with our physical bodies and they have to be somewhere. So one question is, where is the story set? Where does the, what, what does the world, where does the scenario happen in the world? What is the environment where does this story take pl takes place? That's the in-game, in-fiction question. The off-fiction, out-of-fiction question, of course, is where will this game be played? Like, what is the environment? What is the physical location? What is the country? What is the city? What is the address? And is it in this part or that part of the room? And how will the fictional place look to the players? Will it look much like the, it does in the fiction, or will they have to imagine quite a lot? So the first slider, uh, and I don't think that you should approach these in this order. Sometimes you do the sliders in a completely different order, or you do tweak, tweak them all a little bit while you design, and then you end up with something. Um, but a practical, this is often determined by time and place and money constrictions. So this is the one that I, I suggest that you take it up relatively early, scenography. What will the game look like while it's being played? Are you aiming for a 360 degree realism? That means all around you, everything that the player sees is the same as what the character sees. Like if this was a LARP, it would, it would be a LARP set at the LARP Writer Summer School in Ruta in, in Lithuania, and we would have an amazing scenography because it looks exactly <laughs> like what we're trying to achieve. And we would have all traveled here from different countries to get this specific effect, and it would have been very ambitious but also quite expensive for a LARP about a lecture. Um, <laughs> and then maybe that wouldn't have been worthwhile. So if we wanted to play this LARP about this lecture, we could also just have gone into like a backyard and put some chairs up and, and then say, okay, you're gonna have to imagine that there are five windows on this side and like four, three on that side. I mean, you, you, you see what I mean, right? Um, you played uh, with a very minimalist scenography today, uh, at least if you've been in the taped rooms. Uh, I think some of you played Snaphane in a room that looked quite a lot, like the environment that the characters were in. Others played Snaphane in the black box. Those are different scenography choices that may have affected that game, made that game a little different. For Snaphane, it doesn't matter a lot. I think, I, I think that it doesn't, you probably had, the, had just as good a game inside the black box as if you played in a room that looked much like the room that the characters were in, or that if you played it outside in the, in the grass, you probably still had a really good game. That doesn't require it. Um, but sometimes for certain games, or maybe perhaps for, for beginning players, it might be a help to them to, if, they, if they need to play that they are in a room and they can't leave. It might be useful to have at least some tape on the ground for them to imagine where the walls are. That also makes it possible for them to walk to the wall and be like this. And you can't, that effect is very difficult to do if, if everybody kind of imagines where the wall is and they imagine it a little differently. Okay, representation of theme or representation of the content of the game. So 
is it abstractly represented or is it uh, is it abstraction or simulation big words okay so abstraction is like if you instead of showing the thing or the experience or the acting out the emotion you do it symbolically uh, and i think uh, what i'm blanking out what is it called white death yeah that has many symbolic elements an abstract representation of things that are happening in the game um, but maybe we could say that we're making a game about the ponies but the ponies, the pony election, but the ponies aren't actually like present. The ponies are symbolically, uh, the election is symbolically represented by we have different colored candies on this table and then we all paint a flower on our cheek and that's a, and then we are symbolically representing the horse thing by ritual sort of neighing and go <laughs> before we start. You know, that could be one way of like abstractly representing hoarseness. Uh, or you could have very realistic horse costumes uh, and very realistic voting ballots where you do that in, instead if you want to go for a very realistic representation. And of course loyalty to setting, I put this here, it's sort of a writerly, this is about when you decide what kinds of stories will happen in your scenario. A really good question is what is it more important to you? That the story is super realistic inside the framework that you have decided or that it's interesting. So for instance, uh, I think probably it's not super realistic that the politicians in the space game would just let the astronauts die. Um, probably there would be like the media wouldn't look at that kindly and they would try to at least pretend to save them. But it makes a much more interesting game if, if there's a real threat that you're just gonna let them die in space, right? So you, you can, sometimes you have to decide what is more fun to play and then you just agree with the players. Okay, maybe this isn't super realistic but we're gonna do this anyway because it's awesome. And when you think about how movies work, very often, you know, you're just going to accept that this gun fires a million rounds. And then that's okay, that's fine. Because we've just agreed that that's how the world works. Okay. Then the next big chunk of what you can design and control for when you make a LARP is players and what they do. And I just said that you can't control what's in the player's head. So how, is, how does this work? Well, you can't control what's in their head, but you can sort of lure them on board. You can get them all to agree to play by the rules that you have established. Sometimes you establish them yourself, and sometimes you, some of them you establish together with the players. So a big part of making your LARP is, decide, is deciding how you control how the players act or the, the participants. So one, some questions. Who decides what or whom the players will play in your LARP? What kind of characters there are and who plays what characters? Who decides that? Are the characters that are being played, are they very similar to the players or very different from the players? Will they, are like, is in your LARP, would I play Shmohana Shmulyonen from Fmininland, who is otherwise completely identical with me? Uh, maybe I would do that in the LARP school LARP. Uh, that would be a, a character that's very similar to me, except has a much more stupid name. Um, but in the pony LARP, uh, probably I would play a character that's quite different from myself, partly because it's a horse. But maybe you could design a pony LARP where it's like the exact same person, like all of my family history and all of my broken hearted love stories are also in the pony's tale, so to speak. <laughs> you could design it that way. And then I would probably have a very strong uh, emotional experience even though I was playing a horse and you could do that on purpose that's tricky because the players can tend to react very strongly to it and sometimes of course you're going to do it accidentally sometimes in every LARP no matter even if they play the cook in the Harry Potter LARP or something something might happen that reminds the player of something that they have experienced that gives them a rough time that can absolutely happen and you can't really protect yourself from it but you can, you can at least not do it on purpose unless that's the point of the game, right? So uh, you can decide to make the characters quite different from the players. How demanding does this game need to be? Like how physically hard does it really need to be? Does this game become a lot better if I have to walk on all fours all the time? Or could we possibly imagine a horse world where the horses walk on their back feet? If we are in a prison camp, do I actually have to be cold? Do, do I really need to be hungry? If we play drunk people, do I have to, how drunk do I have to be? 
um, if I play insane, do you have to make me insane or would it be okay to design some environment where I can just have an experience of how, what it feels like to be insane without actually going crazy? And the answer is, that would be better and uh, we, will tell you, <laughs> we will tell you later how that is done. Who controls the direction the stories take? Is it the players or is it you? Do the players think as individuals? Do they think about, this is my experience and now my character wants this and I'm just going to go for what my character wants because my character wants this? Or do they think as a group? Do they think, okay, we are playing this game together and we're telling this story together and my character wants this and that character wants that, but the most awesome story for everybody is if I don't get what I want, but that person does get what they want. Like, maybe the fat kid gets to make a goal in the hockey finals and then like, that always happens in movies, right? It's not plausible, but it's a much more satisfying story. It's always a much more satisfying story. And I would much rather tell that story, even if it means that I'm playing the hockey champion and I have to fall on my face to give them the opportunity to score that goal. I would so much rather be part of that story because it would be so emotionally satisfying, especially if my character is a real asshole, right? Then I, I as a player, may decide to, to punish my character. <laughs> but in some games, uh, in some games, they, are, they don't, don't work if the players don't play very indiv individualistically. So you have to decide what the purpose of the game is, and then you need to make sure that the players know how to do it. So and just run through the player, some of the player failures real fast. We're going to do this uh, very soon, very well. Openness. Do, do the players know the same things as the characters? You just played a game where the players know a lot more than the characters do. That can be interesting, but not always appropriate. Character creation. Is it the responsibility of the organizers or of the players to make their own characters? We're going to talk about this later again, so I'm not going to go into it, but both sides, there's not, no right or wrong. Like both sides have different effects and you use them for different purposes. Story engine. That's what I just talked about with the hockey goal. Is, is the story driven by collaboration or competition? And you can talk about whether it's the characters collaborating uh, or the players, and these are kind of, kind of different things. You can have a, a game where all the characters are um, the fellowship of the ring, and they are trying to sneak past the orcs to save the world together. They could do that, for instance, and the, maybe the orcs wouldn't even be in the game because it wouldn't be about the competition, really. It would be about the collaboration, for instance. Uh, bleed in sounds very dramatic, don't worry. Uh, it's not about actual bleeding, it's about how emotions travel between the character and the player. So bleeding would be if the if experiences and emotions that the player has are designed to go into the game on purpose, how much of that do you want to do? And I mean, part of that might be really useful. I mean, if, if you are 12 years old um, and the design, the game requires everybody to, to play middle-aged people, the 12-year-old might not have a lot of experiences to draw on from their own life. <coughs> Uh, so then you might have to create a very specific set of instructions of a very fictional character for this person so that the 12-year-old can understand how to be a 50-year-old. But if you have a real 50-year-old, you can say, like, well, these and these and these things are important for the game. Otherwise, you can just use any, anything in your experiences of being a balding 50-year-old man and just like run with those emotions. That's going to make the game great. But if you give that instruction to a 12-year-old girl, her experience of being Tony Soprano is not going to be very strong, if you know that in the television show. Yeah. Uh, player pressure uh, is the hardship. Do the players experience all the challenges of the characters, physically and emotionally? They don't need to. Sometimes you would want to do that. Quite often, it's fine if the, if the characters are suffering, but the players are loving it. Okay. And communication style, this one actually we're not going to have a specific fader on because all of the games that you play are, are kind of implicitly covering this. So this question is, do the players express and experience their characters physically or verbally? And there are games where there is almost no language spoken. Uh, and I think elements in White Death, it has, it has some quite strong elements of physical play where you let your bodies do the talking in different ways. You can design characters in a way, for instance, where it's an important part of every character is how they walk quite difficult to maintain for the players for a long period of time, but for a short game that might be good, like on this person or and if or if you play old, like do you do it with like this expression or do you just walk around being like old looking and maybe wearing a beard and speaking with an old voice? Um, 
but it's also about about what the what the characters are meant to be doing in the game in the U model United Nations game where everybody sits around the table and speaks diplomatic language it's completely pointless to design physical methods probably because they are only going to express their characters through speech and if it's a game about ponies and maybe the ponies don't even have a spoken language but they only hum love songs then maybe physical expression is super important. And then you have to, to spend a lot of time on, on, on thinking of how that should work and, and teaching the players to, to do that and to love that together. So that's how you design and control what the players do. And quite often these sliders are a choice. What does the player do? Or how much of this does the player get to control? Of course, the answer, the other side of that is whatever you don't give to the players is your responsibility. And this is, a, 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 this is difficult to weigh. Sometimes it's better, quite often it's easier that you decide everything, but then you have to get the players on board and you have to communicate to them what, what you're trying to achieve. Uh, and that might take just as much time as letting the players do it. And in, in reverse, if you think letting the players do it will save you time, uh-uh. Because <laughs> like, you need to understand what they have decided, that you need to make, be there every step of the way to make sure that what the players are designing together fits into your overall vi vision of what the game should try to achieve. So finally, uh, we have what I guess could, could be called writing and game mastering. So when you thought, as you are thinking of all of these, these things, some final questions that you need to, to put out there are, what do you need? you as the maker of this game. What do you need to decide, create, write, build? Um, and if you don't have a lot of time, make a game that requires you to design, create, and build very little. That puts a lot of effort on the players. And it might not make a really good game, but it might make a really good game if you do this smartly. So th this is what we're trying to learn. What will you do once the game has started? Will you be in there as a director saying freeze? Will you dress up as a, as a black pony and go in and be like the mysterious black horse candidate who shows up late in the election? Is that your role? Will you be the mailman who delivers mail from the invisible, invisible player? And will you may perhaps be sitting in another room writing letters from the all the characters who are not present in the LARP? These are all ways that you can affect the game while it's on. But you need some games, you can just start the players and then you can go have a cup of coffee and then after an hour they're going to come out and tell you how the game went and if they loved it or not. That's also a completely valid design. And sometimes you just want to be an ordinary player among the other players, that's also fine. Will there be people in the game who are not playing the same character all the time? Will there be a Captain Wikström who pops in every once in a while and otherwise is a game master outside the room? Uh, will there be moments when the players break the game and talk about and, and the st step out of character and talk to each other as players. Will there be moments where the players go into a black box and suddenly I play your brother and you're the mother horse and we play a flashback scene from our childhood in the stables. That, and then we go back and play our ordinary characters. That could also happen. But you have to decide about that. So the final two sliders are game master style is the game master, and that would be another word for organizer. This comes from the, from the tabletop role playing tradition. Is the game master an active or passive force during the game? What tools does the game master use to affect the story and the experience? And meta techniques, big word, don't be scared. You've already used a lot of them, like monologues, for instance. Will the players sometimes step out of their characters to do or say things that their characters don't know? Um, maybe, but it's not necessary. You decide that as you do decide everything because you are, in fact, the god of your LARP that you make. There are so many more sliders that could exist uh, on this mixing desk. So I guess the last one, it says your slider here. And what you're going to notice as soon as you start designing games this week, that there are many, many other parameters that you can control. Uh, and find those and write them down and experiment with what happens if you change them. And uh, then come back and tell us because we need to learn more. Now I will say thank you. And I have like one minute for questions or two. But probably I'm not going to answer your questions because I'm going to say that's going to be covered later. So thank you.